Up next on Currents News, the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg's seat on the Supreme Court is vacant. I'm Jessica Easthope with who President Trump wants to replace the Brooklyn native. Also ahead on Currents News, the Brooklyn Diocese is making an appeal to the parents of public school students. And a Catholic protest led by the Archbishop in a city that still hasn't allowed the faithful back inside churches to worship. And this. Over 50 members of the Brooklyn Diocese receiving a huge honor directly from Pope Francis. I'm Emily Drubian. That is coming up. The news starts right now. The memorial for Ruth Bader Ginsburg is growing today outside her childhood home in Midwood. By the tree near her old doorstep, people are leaving flowers, candles, and heartfelt handwritten notes for the Brooklyn-born Supreme Court Justice. And outside Ginsburg's alma mater, James Madison High School, more tributes to the Justice, who also became a pop culture icon, known later in life as the notorious RBG. Students there left her a promise. We'll take it from here. Her death has set into motion a fierce political battle just weeks before the upcoming presidential election. Good evening, I'm Christine Persichetti. President Trump says he will wait until the end of the week after services are held for the late justice to announce his nominee. The president has already said it will be a woman and on his short list is a conservative Catholic from Indiana. Current News Jessica Easthope has more on that and what's at stake for the future of the high court. The passing of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg is setting the scene for a new politically charged battle in what has already been a divisive campaign. Now with just weeks to go before the election, a lifetime appointment to the Supreme Court is also at stake. And they always refer to the October surprise and we're not even in October yet, but this does kind of change the dynamic. Brian Brown is the assistant vice president of government relations and an adjunct professor of political science at St. John's University. He says the country is waiting to see if history will repeat itself as Justice Ginsburg leaves a vacant seat on the Supreme Court. The Republicans, when they were faced with a similar situation in 2016, they did not consider then President Obama's nomination. So now there's a call that, you know, that same sort of practice or precedent should be put into place. As for the nomination, President Trump has one thing decided. I will be putting forth a nominee next week. It will be a woman. Topping the list of candidates is Amy Coney Barrett, a conservative and a Catholic who was a finalist for the last vacancy, which was ultimately filled by Brett Kavanaugh. A conservative uh, member of the Federalist Society, mother of seven, two of them adopted from Haiti. She would be the youngest uh, justice, so she could have a long influence on the court. Barrett's political and religious beliefs have been cause for controversy in the past. She is someone who has faced some tough and frankly unfair questioning her last time around. Senator Feinstein questioned some of her dogma and her deeply held Catholic beliefs. Historically, the Catholic vote is split evenly down the party line. But if a nominee is confirmed ahead of Election Day, Brown says the Catholic vote might have more power. Catholics who are concerned about the issue of life, uh, they will be energized by the idea of uh, another justice appointed by President Trump. Former Vice President Joe Biden says he will not release his list of potential nominees and has called on Republicans to hold off until after Election Day. President Jessica Trump's East Hope, nominee. Currents News. Today's the first day of public school for New York City students, but only the youngest and those children with special needs return to the classrooms this morning. The rest of the city's 1.1 million students started virtually. Currents News' Emily Druby has the first day back and what's ahead for the city's public schools. Backpacks and buses seen around New York City on Monday as public schools began their staggered rollout. Kids in 3K, Pre-K and District 75 special education started in-person learning. The rest of the city's 1.1 million students started virtually. A far cry from the city's original plan, which had all students starting in person today. That was changed last minute just five days ago. Still, parents of the Big Apple's youngest students were thrilled to get their kids back into a class. Classroom. My son is uh, too excited. Very excited, excited and happy. 
With the new plan, 90,000 students start in-person learning this week at 734 schools and 1,050 community-based early childhood programs. Mayor Bill de Blasio called the first phase of the rollout inspiring. First time our kids are going back into a school building in large numbers since the middle of March. But still, some parents are worried. The COVID-19, then I'm a little bit scared. Understandably, since the road to schools reopening has been long and bumpy. In-person learning has now been delayed twice. Health, safety and a lack of teachers have been to blame. The new staggered reopening plan has elementary schools both K through 5 and K through 8 going back next Tuesday, while middle schools, high schools, secondary schools and transfer adult education don't start until October 1st. Despite continued delays, Mayor de Blasio remains optimistic. It's a huge number of schools and early childhood programs and they're starting strong. So I feel very good about the trajectory we're on. Encouraged by the school safety procedures and by the sight of the city's youngest students successfully wearing their masks. They were wearing those masks. It was natural for them. That's going to be crucial to everyone's health and safety. Even four year olds, three year olds can do it. About 42% of the city's students have opted to start the year learning virtually, while most students who do go to in-person classes will still have a hybrid schedule. On the Upper East Side, Emily Druby, Currents News. New York City's mayor also took the time to visit one of the diocese's Catholic schools today, Bill de Blasio and the city's first lady, Charlene McRae, greeting the universal pre-K students at St. Bartholomew Catholic Academy in Elmhurst, Queens. The mayor highlighting how educators are keeping kids safe with markers on the sidewalk for social distancing and making sure all the young students are wearing face masks. The continuing delays in opening the city's public schools prompting the vicar for Catholic schools in the Brooklyn Diocese to speak out. The 66 schools in the diocese opened for in-person learning almost two weeks ago. And Monsignor David Casado, who's also pastor of St. Athanasius St. Dominic's Church in Bensonhurst, has a message for public school parents, and he joins us now to share it with us. So, Monsignor, um, what is it that you want public school parents to know about the Catholic schools? First of all, I want them to know we're open <laughs> yes. and where kids are in class and they're doing wonderful and we've had two weeks of relatively fine work and we have abundance of caution good cleaning masks social distancing the classrooms are wonderful I go over and it's just a joy to see the kids back in school yeah how has it been going then for it's just weeks? it's great because Everybody is focused. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have temperature checks and you have all sorts of, you know, all security and all the sorts of hygiene, right. personal hygiene. It's going very well, Christine. What's been the response from public school parents? Are people calling you? The doors, are, the bells are ringing, the doors are banging on the doors. We have had a great enrollment and more and more public school parents are coming over and I'm very happy to see that. I did a little bit on church on Sunday and we have Facebook live stream mass mm -hmm. and we got two calls this morning already. Wow. So tell us what is the benefit of sending your child to Catholic school as well, opposed to a public yes, school? First of all, the teaching of the faith. Mm -hmm. Do you remember yes, I when do. you were a young lady <laughs> at St. Rita in Long Island City yes. and Father Dave used to come up to the eighth grade <laughs> and teach religion? Do you remember those days? I do. Of course I remember uh, those days. Uh, right. Those were great days <laughs> and were. we had wonderful days there. Mm -hmm. And first of all, that the teaching yeah. of the faith right. in, in the schools the priests go in and meet with the kids very often so it's a good connection with the church and the, the sacraments are, are taught in the church and go to mass go to confession mm -hmm. and it's much more structured and it's a very good way the values of Catholic education teaching the faith and also teaching morals in our society today we need to teach the morality of good Christian living Absolutely. Uh, but during the pandemic, as you know, many people were laid off from their jobs, so Catholic schools aren't free. Um, what do you say to these parents, these public school parents who want to put their kids in Catholic schools but just can't afford it? I tell them whether there's a will, there's a way. Mm -hmm. First, we'll give assistance, tuition assistance. You got to go to Futures in Education, the Catholic Foundation. There's assistance that be, can be given to any kid that wants to go to a Catholic school. They just have to work at it. And I'm sure if there's a really a sincere desire, we'll work something out. 
All right, so can parents enroll their kids mid-semester? You know, the, cl the, the school year's already going. Can people start enrolling now? Registration is going on today, right now. I know of at least 10 people that are trying to get their kids into Catholic school today. All right, so right now your schools are going well. You have the social distancing going on. If you start increasing enrollment, how do you handle that? We got to be creative. <laughs> we got to be creative and look at space. Space is the issue. Looking at space, schoolyards, mod units, mm -hmm. uh, dividing the gym or the auditorium right. into different sections, working it out. In, in St. Athanasius School, we divided the auditorium into four classrooms and divided it with regular strong petitions and it's working out very well. They're beautiful classrooms and the kids, it's just wonderful. Christine, when you walk in and see these kids smiling to be back, aren't you glad you're in school? They Absolutely. love it. They're glad to be back in a classroom. Sure. Virtual, we had to do it, mm -hmm. but we have the ability to be back in school. All right, uh, now really quickly, so how did you get your act together so quickly, um, well, I quicker must than the public I, want, I must tell you this, Dr. Tom and the Office of Catholic mm -hmm. Education, the principals and uh, their staffs have worked tremendously hard. When I tell you, from the day that school closed in June, they started the next day preparing for the summer. We were ahead of the game. Mm -hmm. We submitted plans to Albany and they were all approved. All right, thank you so much, Monsignor Casado, Vicar for Catholic Schools here in the Brooklyn Diocese. Thanks for joining us. God bless you, and I remember you when you were in St. Rita. <laughs> The diocese is offering financial help so kids can benefit from a Catholic education. Futuresineducation.org is where families can apply for scholarships to help out with tuition. And you can help, too, by making a donation to Futures. The Diocese of Brooklyn's Chancellor and new pastor of St. Pancras Parish in Glendale, Monsignor Stephen Aguja, celebrated his first Sunday Mass yesterday after the former pastor there was arrested and removed. Father Francis Hughes was charged with the distribution of child pornography back in July. Monsignor Aguja was then quickly assigned to St. Pancras in early August. He hopes he can help the community there rebuild the faith. As a community, we have a new start. Together as a community, we understand and appreciate and rejoice in the presence and the action of the Lord Jesus among us. Monsignor Aguja says his first step in rebuilding the community will be to regain parishioners' trust. He is promising to always be upfront and transparent. The Diocese of Brooklyn is also vowing to continue reaching out to parishioners at St. Pancras. The diocese currently has strong programs in place to protect minors. Some of the measures include creating the Office of Victim Assistance to help individuals who come forward with allegations of abuse. The office provides counseling, referrals for therapy, and other important resources. Every employee of the Brooklyn Diocese, including students, undergoes mandatory training designed to spot the signs of abuse and how to stop it. In the Brooklyn Diocese, Bishop DiMarzio meets with survivors and listens to them carefully. One result of those talks is the annual Hope and Healing Mass. To contact the diocese's toll-free and confidential sexual abuse reporting line, dial 888-634-4499. New York City is one of three cities labeled as anarchist jurisdictions by the Justice Department. Attorney General William Barr approved the list, which also includes Portland, Oregon and Seattle, Washington. The New York Post reports that the cities could lose federal money for failing to control protesters and for defunding police departments. Barr says when state and local leaders impede law enforcement from doing their jobs, it endangers innocent citizens, including those who are trying to peacefully assemble and protest. There's a lot more news headed your way. People from across the Brooklyn Diocese are being honored with a special recognition from Pope Francis for their selfless devotion to the church and to others in the community. Catholics in San Francisco, led by their archbishop, protesting COVID-19 restrictions that are keeping churches closed. And the Holy Father will address a global audience when he explains to the UN General Assembly how the coronavirus crisis is an opportunity to improve the lives of people all around the world. Now you can help us put your faith in the news. 
The next time you capture a newsworthy event, send us your pictures or video. It's easy. Go to netny.tv slash send us and you may see your submission on Currents News. Catholics in Brooklyn are being recognized by the Pope. More than two dozen people who have devoted their lives to the church are receiving the high award. Current News' Emily Druby was there at St. Joseph's Co-Cathedral for the ceremony where you might see a familiar face from the diocese's tablet newspaper team. For over 35 years, Dr. Elizabeth Lutosh has cared for the homeless as a physician. And so I try to spend as much time as I can with them because I want to show them that I do love them and God is with us all. On Saturday, her dedication was recognized. Elizabeth One of 57 people from the Diocese of Brooklyn to have a papal honor bestowed upon them on Saturday. Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio proud of those who had been selected. We are really blessed in our diocese with people who are really extraordinary and give so much time and, uh, and uh, uh, devotion to the life of the church. So that's what uh, the Holy Father is honored. A huge honor given by Pope Francis and the Vatican based off suggestions made by Bishop DiMarzio. The honorees are people who give much of their time and self to others. Like Dolores Casey, who for over a decade has been working hard to make Monsignor Bernard Quinn a saint. But nothing good happens right away. You know, you have to work for it, pray for it. Whatever I did, I did out of the love of my heart. Helping others out of love is also how honoree Mother Celine Vatacout lives her life. She's dedicated to caring for the elderly. It's a great privilege. We ask the Diocese of Brooklyn, all people of God, to pray for us, that we will always remain faithful to the charism of our mother founders. Some honorees have also given so much of themselves to serve the diocese, like Deacon Jorge Gonzalez, who oversees every detail of each permanent deacon's five-year journey. It's a feeling that I cannot um, express. It is an honor, it is a blessing. Or Ed Wilkinson, who spent almost five decades as a crucial member of the tablet team, this award coming at the perfect time. I'm retiring on Monday and receiving this award today, so it's kind of like just a nice ending to, uh, to my career. So I'm really excited about it and very grateful to the bishop for nominating me. Many of the people I spoke with said they were so honored to be acknowledged by Pope Francis. They also tell me they'll continue to work hard for the Diocese of Brooklyn and its people. In Prospect Heights, Emily Druby, Currents News. Pope Francis will speak in front of the UN during the General Assembly tomorrow. The Holy Father sending a video message about how the coronavirus crisis can be used to benefit humanity, which is in line with the UN's mission. It is our responsibility to strengthen people's faith in multilateral cooperation and international institutions with the UN at the center. The Holy Father held a series of talks last month about how Catholic teaching can help the world better move forward from the pandemic. The coronavirus crisis shut down churches across the world and slowly they've reopened and Catholics are celebrating mass again. Except in San Francisco where indoor masses are still banned. The Archbishop there says that's unjust. This is a mockery. They are mocking you and even worse, they are mocking God. Archbishop Salvatore Cordelioni joined hundreds of Catholics on Sunday to march through the streets of San Francisco, sending a message that they're essential. Going to Sunday Mass is, is uh, like a freedom of speech. And without that, you take away a lot of our souls. These Catholics want the right to safely worship indoors, but COVID restrictions still prohibit that in San Francisco. You can go shopping in all the shopping malls, but you can't come to church. Oh, we're very happy that, that we're doing this, and it's about time that someone stood up for the churches. This city has some of the toughest COVID restrictions. Currently, outdoor services are permitted with a maximum of 50 people. We're tired of being treated uh, unequally. We're tired of being discriminated against. Archbishop Cordelioni wants mass to be held inside, not outside. This is not that we want to be reckless. We don't want to endanger public health. We can do it safely, and we just want to be unimpeded from doing so. San Francisco Mayor London Breed's office says indoor worship services could resume by the end of the month with 25% capacity. <laughs> 
Meanwhile, in the Diocese of Brooklyn, churches reopened for mass back on June 29th at 25% capacity. Everyone wears masks and maintains social distancing. Here in the Brooklyn Diocese, the dispensation from the obligation to attend mass remains in effect, so the diocese urges anyone who feels sick to stay home. You can watch mass live right here on Net TV. The Gulf Coast is bracing for Tropical Storm Beta. The storm is churning off the coast of Texas with winds of 50 miles per hour. It's expected to bring hours of rain and dangerous flooding. Almost 11 million people are under a flash flood warning in Texas and Louisiana. It's expected to make landfall late tonight. Beta is the 23rd storm of this very active hurricane season. Trump's top envoy is urging the Vatican to challenge China. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo writing in an article of the religious journal First Things that the Holy See's agreement with China has confused Catholics there. The current Vatican agreement allowed the Chinese government to appoint new bishops in the country as long as the Holy See had the final say. Pompeo says that deal has not eased fears that the rights of Christians will be protected from violations of religious freedom. Pompeo's words come as a new report says the Chinese government has imprisoned more Catholic clergy, including bishops. According to a local news station, priests in the Diocese of Yujiang have been placed under house arrest and forbidden from engaging in any religious activity, all because they refuse to support the country's Communist Party. A bishop is also among those ranks. Since the signing of the Vatican-China deal, multiple priests have reported harassment from authorities. Still to come on Currents News, how ancient skills are being used to raise the roof at Notre Dame, restoring the fire-damaged cathedral to its original glory. And a good Samaritan comes to the rescue after a disabled boy's bike is stolen. Carpenters in Paris look to the past to build the future. Since April of 2019, when flames erupted at Notre Dame in Paris, destroying the roof and spire and damaging the upper walls, a massive effort has been underway to restore the landmark. Over the weekend, the team of carpenters used medieval techniques to raise up by hand a three-ton oak truss in front of the cathedral. It's a replica of the wooden structures that were destroyed in the fire. The demonstration was done for European Heritage Days and gave people a first-hand look at the rustic methods used hundreds of years ago to build the triangular frames of the landmark. And finally tonight, a bike shop in Arizona took on the task of rebuilding a damaged bike that had been stolen from a disabled boy. But the bike, which was customized for Frankie Alvarez, who has cerebral palsy, needed a lot of repairs. Despite the missing and broken pieces of the bike, Frankie's hope was restored when the Bike in a Box Foundation gave him a brand new ride for free. I'm just really amazed and blessed that they did it for my son. Lost of words. I'm, I'm happy for him. It's his decision, whatever he wanted. I just want him safe when he rides and just happy. And Frankie was happy after his fitting. He got to take home his brand new bike on the very same day. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time. Thank you.